thank you to the organizers for inviting me. Um, I, I hope not too many of you were at the ECM because this is going to be a very uh, similar talk, but uh, um, uh, if so, I apologize. So I'm going to talk about uh, shift fields, which are an approach to, to refinement using non-atomic parameterizations. Now, refinement is obviously a key step in the structure solution pro process, uh, um, particularly uh, important after molecular replacement. And, and in the case of molecular replacement, we have potentially substantial differences between some localized regions of our search model and, and the, the structure we're, which we're trying to solve, which can make refinement difficult. So uh, the question is, why is it, it dif difficult? Um, sometimes it's because the information isn't there. We don't have the information that we need. But maybe sometimes it's because we're, we're using the wrong kind of methodology. So this technique has taken some inspiration from uh, Tom Terwilliger's model morphing work, um, but actually also uh, James Holton talked about uh, using um, Fourier-based shifts uh, to a model uh, at, at this meeting last year, which is actually uh, not completely different to what we're, we're doing either. So uh, to start off, we need to understand what's happening when we're doing macromolecular refinement. So uh, we have a model and we have an um, uh, electron density calculated from our, our, our observed amplitudes and our, our current phase estimates, and we find some places where they disagree. So in, in this case, it, it's obvious pretty clearly that, that this uh, side chain has to move up along the y direction on, on this picture to, to fit the density. Now, the way we do this in a refinement program is that we calculate a difference map uh, with uh, weighting coefficients to, to take into account the, the, the amount of information that, that we actually have in the data. Uh, so uh, you can see above this side chain that there's positive difference density where we, we, we should have, have density, but there's no atoms. And then where, where the atoms are, we've got negative differences uh, where we've got atoms, but, but the observations don't support them. Now, what we can do conceptually is calculate the gradient of the difference map. And going from this red region to this green region, there's going to be a substantial positive gradient. And um, where atoms are at, at, on that gradient, they, they can go uphill in, uh, to um, uh, better fit the difference map. Okay, so th th that's um, the way it works, and that, that's the way it commonly, we commonly think about it. However, uh, th th there's a slightly different way of, of looking at this, which is that we can calculate the gradient of the um, calculated map, the, the map from the, 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 the electron density from the atoms. So, um, if we calculate the gradient on the y direction, we're going to get positive density above the atoms along the y-axis and negative density below them. Uh, because, uh, sorry, it's, it's the negative of that. Um, uh, because we're going downhill from, from the atoms in the y direction uh, or, or uphill to get onto the atoms. And if you look at these, when we've got similar features in the gradient map and the difference map, which is on this, this side chain here, then that's also telling us that we need to move this side chain a bit up. Uh, up. Whereas if, if we look at the main chain down here, uh, we've, we've again got, got the gradients leading to green above and, and red below, but uh, in the difference map, we've got nothing. So we don't need to move anything. So that's a slightly different way of, of looking at the same thing. Now, the, 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 this is all hidden in the mathematics of refinement. And so here's a little bit from international tables. Um, I, I, is this Sherrod's article? I think it might be. <laughs> yep. Uh, so um, the, the, this is most commonly described as the Agaval form um, of, of uh, uh, um, uh, description of refinement, where we take the gradient of the difference map, that's the, the delta D by delta U, in a particular uh, direction and convolute it with the electron density of a single atom, and that tells us if this atom wants to go uphill in, along a uh, particular gradient direction. So, so that's the, the first simple description that um, 
uh, I, I did, gave you. But there's, a, there's another form of the same equation where you just shift the derivative across the convolution. And this is mathematically identical. Um, it, uh, so there is no difference between the two. Uh, you can prove uh, mathematically that, that they're the same equation. Um, but actually, um, the reason I'm showing you this second form is that because it's going to allow us to, to, to think about the problem slightly differently. Uh, now, I, I, when I gave this lecture at the ECM, people thought I was advocating one of these uh, formulations over the other. I'm not. They're mathematically identical, uh, and you need to understand that they're identical to understand why, uh, what I'm, I'm going to tell you works. Right. Okay. Now, a couple of details here. So the, this, this row with a line through it is the density of a single atom. And so when we convolute that with, with the gradient of the difference map, that tells us how this one atom wants to move on its own to better uh, uh, account for, for the observations that we've got. And as a result, we get parameter shifts for each atom individually. So this atom wants to go this way, this one wants to go another way. There we are, here's a picture. Uh, maps, unfortunately, are noisy. Gradient maps are, are noisier. So the atoms are getting pulled in all directions, pulling the molecule apart. We've, we've got some shifts which, which are due to genuine features of the data and, and some sh shifts which are, are pulling the mo molecule apart because the, uh, of the noise in the maps. So what can we do about this? Uh, we can add geometry restraints. So in, in any refinement program, you've got uh, your, your um, X-ray gradient term, which, which uh, brings your model into agreement with the data uh, of the observations, and you've got your geometry th term, which sup uh, stops the noise in the maps from pulling it apart. So uh, these often en end up pulling against the de density gradients to hold the model together. Uh, so the atom's getting pulled in different directions, and, and, and this, this can slow down convergence in refinement programs. Uh, this is offset in, in, in uh, some programs by, by implementation of, of full or sparse matrix methods, which again uh, adds a computational cost. Right, so do we have to do all of this? Well, tying refinement to uh, atom parameters also ties us to uh, atomic resolution, and then we're patching the fact that we're tying ourselves to individual atoms by introducing a, a geometry restraints to mitigate this behavior with a, with a certain amount of success. Uh, I'm going to suggest an alternative approach, which is don't tie the refinement to individual uh, atoms when we don't have atomic resolution. Uh, and that's, that's, that's really the key step here. So uh, we'll start with the Lifshitz formulation, which is identical to the Agarwal formulation, but, but uh, it, it's more convenient for understanding this. And what we're going to do, instead of convoluting the difference map with the gradient of, of the calculated map for an individual atom, we're going to make two changes. The first change is instead of looking at an individual atom, we're going to look at a big sphere of density. And we can just change that, that sphere of density however we want according to the resolution. Low resolution, use a big sphere. High resolution, uh, uh, use a small sphere. Atomic resolution, use a single atom. So, so it, it now becomes something that varies naturally with resolution. And, and the second change we'll make is, is, is that we'll, we'll use a, a, a linear regression of the difference map against the gradient map instead of um, uh, this, this convolution uh, type step. Um, I, I, I don't know whether that second step makes a difference, but it just seemed obvious to me, and it, it, it um, um, potentially insulates you against the effect of some missing low-resolution terms, um, a, 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 a missing constant uh, in the electron density. Um, I, I haven't thought of a good... I, I really want to know whether that helps or, or not, but I haven't thought of a good test yet. So, oh dear, out of date. Um, so, I, I said we're going to use a, a, a big sphere 
of, of density to calculate smooth uh, uh, shifts over, over the region of that sphere. Um, we're actually using a radius which is about five times the resolution rather than four times. And, and it's not hard sphere, it sort of drops off towards the edges um, uh, in a, a, a quadratic form, which, which we determined by trial and error seems to work uh, nicely. So, what happens when we do this? We get something which I call a shift field, which is a, a set of shifts. Uh, it is a, a map of shifts to each parameter that we're interesting, uh, interested in. So, we, we get, uh, if we're doing coordinate refinement, we get three electron de density maps covering the whole unit cell. One of, of shifts in the x direction, one of shifts in the y direction, and one of shifts in the z direction, which we can represent by vectors. And these vary smoothly across the map um, because we're, we're, we're averaging over a big sphere. So my, my big sphere here overlaps largely with the big sphere here. So, so the shift here is going to be largely the same as shift, the shift here. So uh, the, the, the shifts vary smoothly. So, so we, we make big coordinated shifts to, to kind of stretch the, the, the model onto the map gracefully. Uh, and we can adapt gracefully to any resolution by varying the radius. So, does it work? So, uh, we did a, a, a little test, 63 molecular replacement test structures from Melanie Volmar, um, and we did three tests. And the first one was that we ran 20 cycles of RefMac. Uh, the second test was that, that uh, we ran 20 cycles of shift field refinement, starting at six angstroms resolution, so we can run this at really low resolution, and, and then going up to three angstroms resolution, um, and, and the, 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 the averaging sphere is, is four or five times uh, that radius. And, and then we do 20 cycles of RefMac. And then the third test, uh, we do uh, uh, the other protocol for dealing with this sort of problem, which was 200 cycles of jelly body refinement in RefMac, followed by 20 cycles of RefMac. So, um, here are the results. So, now, a whole load of structures, RefMac was, was, was refining to the right answer anyway. Uh, so, down the bottom here, we, we have the R factor that you get out of RefMac just uh, using... Um, uh, RefMac refinement, and then uh, up the side we have the R factor that you get using shift field refinement and then uh, RefMac refinement. So all the ones on the diagonal, it hasn't really made any difference. So RefMac was getting the right answer anyway. However, there are some cases where there were big shifts required which RefMac wasn't picking up. So those are the crosses below the line, and there's a couple of sh uh, cases where, there, where the improvement is 5 or 6% in R factor. So those are, are really quite significant cases. Okay, uh, here's a, a, another comparison comparing shift field followed by RefMac to jelly body in RefMac followed by conventional RefMac. And you can see there's a lot less difference. There's some of the cases where, where the shift field refinement and the jelly body refinement have, have done the same thing, but there's also a few cases where, where shift field refinement is still doing 1 or 2% better, and, and one case where it, it's, it's doing much better. Now, okay, let's look at uh, that, that one outlier, the, the kind of poster child case, to find out what the difference is in this case. Uh, so, th th there are two orange structures here. One is the deposited structure. Uh, the, the, the other orange one is the one that came out of shift field followed by RefMac, and the, the blue one is, is jelly body followed by RefMac. So the difference is that uh, these two helices down here and the loop up above them have had very substantial shifts, and those shifts have been about four angstroms uh, for the, the atoms which move furthest. So it is making these big coordinated uh, shifts. Right, uh, RefMac is a very fast refinement program. Um, uh, um, uh, yes, yes, I think it, it, it's the fastest of them by quite a long way. Um, the, 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 the new version compared to the version a year ago is, is uh, two to three times faster still. This is way, way faster still because we don't even have to worry about um, uh, restraints uh, or anything like that. Um, uh, and also because we can do it at very low resolution. 
Uh, so both of those uh, uh, make a difference to speed. Uh, so the speed's dependent solely, or uh, not solely, but largely on the t cost of the electron density calculation, which we haven't really begun to optimize and is trivially parallel as well. Um, it's completely independent of our regression radius, of the size of our sphere, um, because it's all done by fast Fourier transforms. Um, having said that, while this is very uh, fast, you do have to do your conventional ref mac afterwards. So it's, it, it's, it's really um, uh, taking out the, 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 the long jelly body run. Uh, and we, we think we can get at least another factor of three in performance when, once we start optimizing. Um, uh, my colleague Stephen Metcalf has, has been uh, working on applying this to uh, another problem. So we could, we've already done uh, coordinate refinement and B-factor refinement, but uh, you can use this to, to refine anything. Uh, so um, anisotropic uh, um, uh, uh, U-values, uh, you could even do resolution in the case of, of uh, EM or, or occupancy. Uh, anything you can, you can put in as a parameter, you can refine by this method. So um, he, he, um, uh, Stephen ran this on a whole load of structures, uh, uh, working with, with the full resolution of the data that was available in this case. We don't truncate uh, the resolution. Um, and uh, we see a, a significant uh, reduction in our factor versus isotropic only refinement. Um, and and the, the improvement uh, varies from, from just a very small amount to about 7%, an average of... of uh, 3% improvement. Now, uh, I, I'm not claiming that this does anything that uh, conventional anisotropic refinement or TLS refinement wouldn't do them uh, already. Uh, so in, in, in the highest resolution cases, 1.5 angstrom, you could just turn on an anisotropic refinement in, in RefMac and, and get very similar improvement. In, in the lowest resolution cases, well, um, uh, around 3 angstroms, then, then you would use TLS refinement and, and get a similar benefit. Um, so so I, I, I'm not sure this is doing anything you couldn't do before, but it, it's doing it all in a single very simple method that, that degrades gracefully from individual atom anisotropic refinement to a TLS-style refinement as the resolution drops. Um, and and we, we see it working down to about 3 angstroms resolution, but but not really any, any benefit beyond that. Okay, so uh, the software is available. Um, it's called SheetBend, uh, um, although it bends helices too. Uh, that's another nautical name, uh, kind of not. Uh, it's available in, in the CSP4 source repository. Um, uh, however, uh, last time I checked, there, there wasn't a build script for it, so that's on, on my website. Uh, so it's there. You can, you can try it out and run it from the command line at the moment, and we'll get to uh, integrated. The, the version that's currently distributed does coordinate uh, refinement and isotropic B-value refinement. Um, uh, the anisotropic U-value refinement is, is in testing and in future, so we're obviously going to re release that. Uh, we want to get it in, into a CCP4 update and increase, uh, integrate it in, in uh, the I2 molecular replacement uh, pipelines. Uh, Randy and Ellie are talking about uh, using it in phaser, which, which will be uh, exciting. And, and there's also an obvious application to EM to the case of um, conformational variability. So where, where you've got particles which, which have um, uh, uh, molecules in different conformations and, and currently you, you, you group these into clusters and deal with them separately. Uh, now, it, in some cases, you, you can potentially merge those clusters or improve the clusters themselves by refining each particle against the, the uh, cluster average. And, and it's much easier with phases. So that's a, a very exciting future application that we would like to get involved in. Okay. Uh, so that's everything. People, uh, John Aguirre uh, worked on this for a bit. Uh, Stephen Metcalf has done a, um, most of the stuff on anisotropic use, and Melanie provided the test data. Um, funding was on a BBSSC grant, um, the, the current CCP4 grant, and, and there will be a further development of this on, on the next CCP4 grant and my CCP4 fellowship. Okay, thank you.